Welcome to the 2018 Maritime Gala. Please rise for the presentation of the colors and the playing of our national anthem. Advance the colors. Please welcome John McDermott of the Irish Tenors to sing the national anthem. Please join me in the singing of our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and the bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Retire the colors. Please welcome Captain Gregory Todd, who will now give the invocation. Let us pray. Eternal Father, in your graciousness you have given us the great honor and privilege of serving as part of the United States Sea Service. The Navy the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard. You also bless us with the joy of serving with shipmates we respect and value, some of whom we will be honoring tonight. You have also blessed us with families and ask for your support for those families as they seek to navigate the challenges of military service. Lord, you have told us to love our neighbor and every day we get to do things that are for the good of our neighbor and your creation. But Lord, I would venture to say that I see your fingerprints all over our work, and you are truly the one doing the defending, the caring, the saving, the helping, and the protecting. Because of your goodness, Lord, we are bold to ask for your presence with us here tonight. Bless our food, our time together, and the camaraderie we share, and the mission you have called us to. And finally, dear Lord, be with our shipmates. 
who are on duty underway or standing the watch. Send your holy angels to protect them in their tasks and grant them a joyful reunion with their faithful loved ones who wait for them at home. It's into your hands we commend our prayers, trusting in your love and your mercy. Amen. Please be seated. Join me in thanking John McDermott, Captain Todd, the United States Coast Guard Ceremonial Band, and the United States Sea Services Color Guard, coordinated by the Naval District of Washington. And now, the United States Coast Guard Band will play a medley of our Armed Force Service songs, including Merchant Marines. Please rise when your service song is played.
ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the 49th National President of the Navy League of the United States, Mr. Alan Kaplan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for joining us at the Navy League's first ever Maritime Gala. We are so excited to have you here in celebration of all of our sea services and their families. It is such an honor to be in the company of such a distinguished crowd. To all of our longtime friends, the Navy League values you and your endless appreciation and support of our mission. And to all our new friends, members and distinguished guests, welcome to this evening's celebration. I cannot tell you how excited I am to see so many new faces interested in supporting the mission of our Navy League. Thank you. All of us here represent the future of our Navy League. Under new leadership, we are combining our proven 115-year-old world-class defense with a new energized offense that is focused on urgency and performance. To quote our CNO, Admiral Richardson, the Navy must get to work now to both build more ships and to think forward, innovate as we go. To remain competitive, we must start today and we must improve faster. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you tonight that is exactly how our Navy League is moving forward. We must start today and we must improve faster. Our future is bright and it is because we are all here working together as one team, mission focused, and with a heightened sense of urgency. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and honor to acknowledge our partners and the co-chairs of this event. Tom Higgins, Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of First Data, and Bruce Mosler, Chairman Global Brokerage of Cushman and Wakefield. Tom and Bruce are both life members and serve on the board of the Navy League Foundation that Tom Higgins chairs. I've been working very closely with Tom and Bruce and I know that Bruce captured the essence of our team best when he said that what we are doing is for the half of the 1% who are prepared to lay down their lives to protect our freedoms. This is all about serving our mission. Tom and Bruce, if you could both please stand and be recognized. Tom and Bruce, our Navy League is proud to call you and your organizations our partners, and I'm proud to call you both my friends. Please join me again in thanking Tom and Bruce for their phenomenal support. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is vital to our Navy League that we use every avenue possible to spread the mission of our Navy League. This is all about learning, 
competing, and winning. Tonight, we are proud to debut our new video that focuses on the pillars of our important mission. We hope you enjoy it. The United States is a maritime nation, from Navy vessels keeping watch around the world day and night, to Coast Guard personnel keeping our borders safe, to ensuring our cargo is protected on its journey overseas. This country relies on the strength of our seas to thrive. Founded with the support of President Theodore Roosevelt in 1902, the Navy League of the United States has played a vital role in supporting our nation's sea services. Whether it's in support of the U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, or U.S. Flag Merchant Marine, our Navy League members around the world are a powerful force in educating and advocating for strong sea services. Hello, I'm Alan Kaplan, the 49th National President of the Navy League of the United States. I am so honored to be leading our organization as we work tirelessly to elevate our mission to new heights never experienced before. Every day I witness firsthand how our Navy League team makes such a meaningful impact to the well-being of our nation's sea services and in the lives of our sea service men and women as well as their families. To our Navy League family, we are one team mission focused. Thank you for all you do. With nearly 50,000 volunteer members in 220 councils around the globe, the Navy League is the only civilian military service organization poised to make such a significant difference in the lives of our sea service members and their families. Our local councils and their members organize ship commissioning ceremonies, support family members of active duty sailors and Marines, and educate Congress. Congress must fund our maritime services at the highest levels so that we'll be the most powerful force of good both at home and around the world. The Navy League plays a critical role in educating and advocating for strong sea services. Whether at one of our special corporate events, at our Sea Airspace Exposition, or through our Sea Power magazine, the Navy League provides one independent voice for the entire maritime community through education and collaboration. And our organization ensures that the sea services will remain powerful well into the future by supporting youth efforts like the Navy Sea Cadet Corps, Young Marines, and STEM programs. We are so proud of our instrumental role in growing our next generation of leaders. Through our national, international, and local programs, the Navy League supports the strength of our nation's defense, well-being, and economic prosperity. We are honored to selflessly serve those who serve others and sacrifice so much for us. Join us in our mission. Selflessly serving those who serve others. That line defines our organization. And speaking of serving others, I want you to know how grateful we are for those of you who protect us and keep us all safe every day. We are honored tonight to have all four of our Sea Service Chiefs here with us this evening. It is my privilege to welcome our Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Richardson and his wife, Dana. <laughs> Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Neller and his wife, Darcy. <laughs> Commandant of the Coast Guard, Admiral Zukunft and his wife, Fran. Maritime Administrator, Rear Admiral Busby, and his wife, Gina.
I would now like to ask that all those in uniform currently serving and those who have served our great nation in the past, along with their families, to please stand so we may recognize you. We thank you for your selfless service and daily sacrifices to protect and preserve our country and way of life. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, how are we doing tonight? Thank you. Hey, I'm going a little bit off script tonight. I came here with the uh, thought that I would have almost nothing to do, but this is just too great an opportunity. And they, oftentimes speakers will say, hey, listen, you know, continue to have your coffee, continue to have your dessert and everything. I'm actually going to ask that you be completely silent and give me your full attention. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Hey, listen, uh, what a fantastic event here, Sea Air Space in 2018, the biggest the best, the most attended, really, uh, you know, people kind of fighting for the opportunity to come and join this team here at Sea Airspace. And that wouldn't happen without the uh, Navy League, just one of so many things that they do for the sea services. And so, you know, from, from the U.S. Navy, on behalf of the U.S. Navy and the sea services, let's give one terrific round of applause for the Navy League and Mr. Alan Kaplan. Thank you, sir. I will tell you that uh, I have just sort of one ad, ad hoc or self-imposed uh, opportunity tonight, and that's to introduce the, our, our evening speaker. I will tell you that you're in for a, an absolute treat. And I asked him, you know, just so we don't surprise each other, we, we made a promise never to surprise each other. I said, can I have the opportunity to introduce you tonight and he said, okay, what is this all going to mean? I said, don't worry at all. <clears throat> but uh, I will tell you that uh, when you think of everything that this event stands for, in terms of learning, in terms of competing, in terms of winning, you could not ask for a better keynote speaker than the Commandant. He has been on point serving our nation since 1975. He's been in just about every scrap and scrape up that this country has been in since that time. And I will tell you, because I get to see it every day, I get to partner with him every single day. He is an innovative thinker. He is moving the Marine Corps into new territory to make sure that they continue to be relevant in this new era that we're moving into with smart machines, digital communications, everything, all right? He's leading the way intellectually. But I'll tell you far more than that is that uh, you would never ever hope for anybody else to go into a fight with you. And as uh, he and I came into our jobs, probably within about a week, I think, Bob, and uh, right off the bat, committed to making sure that as we got around and did our business, it was absolutely clear to everybody that there is no daylight between the blue side and the green side of this naval team. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce my comrade in arms, my friend of such terrific integrity, my battle buddy, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Bob Neller. <laughs> no, I think I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> well, thank you, CNO. I'm not quite sure what to say. 
So we're going to honor later on another great military leader, Paul Zukunf, who's ending his career later this spring. He and his wife, Fran, are going to go off to Maui and weave palm fronds into something. Icebreakers. Icebreakers. Keep, keep that thought. But congratulations to him and all the other awardees for tonight. So I just echo what the CNO said about the Navy League. I mean, the work that you do and the commercial vendors that are here, the corporations, the small businesses that support our naval force, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without you. And our sailors, our Marines, our Coast Guardsmen really appreciate that support. I mean, this is an interesting year. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. I mean, 50 years ago, the United States was in the middle of Vietnam. And to our Vietnam vets that are here, I'm sure there's a couple. Thank you for making sure that when we come home, You don't, you didn't get the thank you for your service like we get. I'm not sure we deserve it, but you did. And uh, we appreciate that. But 50 years ago, Tet, Way, Quezon, all the stuff that happened that year. A hundred years ago, or later this spring, we're going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Marine battle at Bella Wood and the end of World War I. So a lot of things happening this year. And I'd also thank the league for recognizing uh, the spouses and having a spouse reception. Uh, somebody had been married to his girlfriend from high school for 42 years, 43 years in August, dear. I know, it just seems like yesterday, doesn't it? <laughs> but I, after 28 moves and three kids and I don't know many dogs and living overseas for eight years, um, you'll get paid back one day. So I thought about what to talk about tonight. So the last two days uh, with the CNO and the Commandant of the Coast Guard and the other service chiefs and the COCOMs, we've been at the Pentagon, we've been talking about contingency plans and what we're going to do about this and what we're going to do about that. Today we're at NDU with the Secretary and all the the Deputy Sec Def and all the other undersecretaries, and I thought I'd talk to you about all the planning, everything we got going on. <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> nice try. You guys are so easy. But tonight I would like to talk about a couple things, and particularly your theme for this gathering of Learn, Compete, Win, and that speaks to the heart of, of our Naval Force and the young men and women that serve our Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard today. As Marines, we like to think of ourselves as innovative. Um, from the interwar period, amphibious doctrine, landing craft, amphibian tractors, vertical assault, the first employment of helicopters, uh, Stovall aircraft, ground ISR against the counter IED fight, rollers, on and on and on. Innovation is, is a hallmark of our core, and it remains so today. Uh, your Marines are learning through testing and evaluations of new technologies to try to gain advantages over our competitors, our rivals, and there is competition. We are in competition right now. We're not at war, we're competing below the level of conflict, but make no mistake about it, we're competing every single day. Whether it be in cyber and information, electronic warfare, command and control, engineering, manned and unmanned teaming, robotics, added manufacturing, trying to figure out how to leverage artificial intelligence. Those competitions go on every single day. And advancements in those areas that many of you are involved in and can help us with will help propel us into the future, enabling us to compete. We don't want to compete on the battlefield. We want to dominate the battlefield. Those are Secretary Mattis's words. So we have an exceptional Marine Corps, 99.8% um, are high school grads. We continue to be able to recruit 
that's never taken for granted. Our recruiters are out there every day, just like they are for CNO and for Commandant Paul. So if you know young men or women or have a propensity to serve our nation, whether it be as enlisted or officers, uh, you need to try to steer them our way. And uh, we'll take good care of them. And at the end of four years, they'll have a full-ride college scholarship in their pocket. And they can go out there and do what they need to do with the rest of their life. But I like this Marine Corps a lot. And they can continue to impress us. So today, your Marine Corps is busy, along with our Navy shipmates, engaged around the globe. While we sit here in this beautiful room and have this nice meal and share camaraderie with each other, about 35,000 Marines, along with their Navy shipmates, are forward deployed around the globe. On ship, in the air, on land, working with international partners, deterring adversaries, some in not so nice places, some at risk, some on the edge of conflict. Or they're training hard to replace those that are forward deployed now. In short, you're do they're doing exactly what you would expect them to do in every climate and place, fighting today's fight and standing ready to answer the nation's call. I'll give you a couple examples. 31st Mew Marine Expeditionary Unit and the Amphibious Ready Group, a 7th Fleet, just did an exercise in, on the, near the Pacific or near the Korean Peninsula. First deployment on amphib ships of F-35Bs. Today, amazingly, six for six readiness. Um, I'm not sure I read that right when I saw the report, but that's what it said. <laughs> in CENTCOM, whether it be in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Bahrain, Jordan, in UAE, working with the, U the Emirati forces, they're out there. In AFRICOM, the Special Purpose MAGTAF off the coast of Libya, in Djibouti, training and getting ready to provide security and support for our diplomats and our special operations forces. In UCOM, supporting the SAC here, General Scaparati, uh, in Romania, in Norway, in Georgia, they're doing their business. In Mexico, where I visited a couple weeks ago, a small number of Marines trained the Mexican Marines. So when you see on TV some drug uh, cartel guy getting dragged in front of the in front of the lights to be arrested, and you see two big, strong infantry Marines there that say Mexmar, they were trained by our Marines. And we continue to support Admiral Tidd throughout Southcom, and we'll deploy another special purpose MAGTAF there this June. So in light of the defense strategy, when we reflect on our history, the sea services are critically important. It doesn't matter what department we report to or primary mission we're responsible for. What our services do for the nation is, is critical. The environment is complicated. Uh, our focus is greater than on air, sea, and land. We must open the aperture and sexually, successfully operate in space and cyberspace and under the sea. Our competitors have evolved and are increasing, increasing their capabilities. They are not standing by and watching us. They want to dominate the battle space. So it's essential that we, together, our military, our civilians, our leadership, our political leaders, the business community, all work together to increase our capabilities to keep that competitive ad advantage that we must have. We don't know when the next fight is coming, but we have to be prepared in case it does. So I can't stress to you enough the importance of the maritime domain. If you read the National Defense Strategy, they talk about four types of forces contact, blunt, surge, and homeland defense. CNO, CNO and I would tell you that the maritime force that's out there on patrol every day, the cop on the beat, is that contact force. And they're in an A2AD environment. It just hasn't been turned on yet. And we've got to be able to survive in that environment. And that surge force has got to be able to get to the fight. We have not had to fight to get to the fight since World War II. And if that next fight comes, we will have to fight to get to the fight. And that force will have to conduct sea control, and they'll have to do denial operations in addition to power projection ashore with both land and air forces. So at the very foundation of our economy, every large facet is available to conduct free trade. We've got to control the, ground, the sea lines of communication because we are a maritime nation. Therefore, we must dominate in the maritime domain. And to do that, we have to learn, innovate, adapt, and increase our competitive advantage to win. 
So there are technologies out there. I mentioned some of them earlier. And I'm looking at the people in this room who can help us innovate, find solutions to make us even more lethal than we are today, even more effective, and bring everybody back home alive and well. Whether it's a battalion experimenting with new gear in our Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, or testing gear, we give it to our Marines and they figure out what works and what doesn't work. And they do it very quickly and very honestly and very succinctly. I ran into a couple of Marines here. We had an additive manufacturing uh, booth set up. I had run into these Marines several months ago down at Marine Air Logistics Squadron 26 at New River, and they do the logistics support for our MV-22 squadrons down there. And they were showing me what they could do, and they were a little bit frustrated because they felt that they could make repair parts that needed to be certified in order to properly be, be prepared or to, be, to repair a part on the aircraft. So we're working with the Secretary of the Navy's office, with the Vice Admiral Grossklags at Nav Air, and they had told me today they printed a part that's now been approved. So, I mean, it's a change. They're ready to go. They're waiting. And we cannot have policies and bureaucracy hold them back as long as we can do it safely, properly, and accurately. So these are things that are happening, whether they're going to print their own UAVs, whether they're going to print parts in metal, whether they're going to print parts in polymers. It's going to happen. You're not going to be able to stop it from happening. We just got to figure out how to make it work. And if you've got proprietary rights, you should expect to get paid for your intellectual property. But the day when we ask you for parts is coming to an end. I'll just be very frank. So these Marines are excited, and the sailors, and our soldiers, and our airmen, and our coastmen are doing the same thing. But the bottom line is forums and expositions like this that get this intellectual thought moving. All of you, industry, partner with our sea services are the ones that help develop this new equipment and take these new ideas and tell us how to leverage them to give us equipment that works, is cost effective, and is reliable and maintains good readiness of the force. We need to drive this innovation and come up with new advanced equipment where we can continue to dom dominate the battlefield. So this is an exciting time to be in our military, to be in our country, uh, to be one of our partners in industry, and again, I appreciate you supporting this conference. So we are always in continuous competition. I don't have to tell anybody in this room that, but we always must be ready to compete, learn, and win. We have to win. So thanks again for the opportunity to be with you tonight. CNO, thank you for the great introduction. I know you're all proud of those that wear the uniform. Uh, the old guys like me and uh, Commandant of Coast Guard, uh, we're, we're in the last two minutes of the ball game. Um, there's a lot of young men and women here in uniform. They're starting the first quarter, and they're excited, and they want to play the whole game. And we got to make sure that they get to the end of the game successfully and that they win that competition. So congratulations to the awardees and again, thanks to our spouses. So in closing, I just, you know, we, we did a little commercial that we did for the Super Bowl. We couldn't afford to play it live. <laughs> it cost us too much money just to make it. But it's pretty good and I think it talks about the, the theme of this conference. It talks about the fact that it's the human it's the Marine, it's the sailor, it's the idea that they use a technology, the technology did not use them, and that the competitive advantage that we really have in addition to our equipment is our, is our human talent, is that Marine and sailor, that soldier, that airman out there. So I picture's worth a thousand words. I'd just like to play this video if you haven't seen it, and then I'll take my seat. Everybody have a great evening. Thanks. not just the ships, the armor, or the aircraft. It's something more. It's 
the will to fight and determination to win found inside each and every Marine that answers a nation's call. Battles won. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alan Kaplan, accompanied by Vice Admiral Jay Donnelly, Vice President of Program Integration and Assessment at Huntington Ingalls. Admiral Paul Zunkoff, the 25th Commandant of the United States Coast Guard. Bruce Mosler, Chairman of Global Brokerage at Cushman and Wakefield. Captain Holly R. Harrison, Executive Assistant to the Director, Coast Guard Investigative Service. Tom Higgins, Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of First Data Corporation. And Frank Biziago, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of First Data Corporation. Uh, thank you, General Neller, for your time with us tonight. It has been a pleasure to hear more about your vision for the Marine Corps and our nation. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are proud to honor three special individuals who exemplify what it means to be a leader in their field. These men and women have gone above and beyond the call of duty and are an inspiration to those they work with and serve. They exemplify leadership qualities consistent with our Navy's core values of honor, courage, and commitment. At this time, I'd like to welcome Vice Admiral Jay Donnelly, U.S. Navy retired, to the podium to present this year's Semper Paratus Leadership Award. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight as we celebrate the sea services in all the sea services in one event. It's my honor on behalf of the Navy League of the United States and my friend Alan Kaplan uh, to present a brand new award this evening. The Semper Paratus Award is, uh, is presented to recognize outstanding leadership to a government leader who exemplifies the Coast Guard ethos of honor, respect, and devotion to duty. As you may know, the U.S. Coast Guard motto, Semper Paratus, means always ready. No other organization exemplified that always ready culture better than the Coast Guard did last year as they responded to three major hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, in the span of just one month. It is my honor to present the inaugural Semper Paratus Leadership Award to a real sailor's sailor, the 25th Commandant of the Coast Guard, Admiral Paul Zunkamp. The Navy League of the United States is honored to present the inaugural Semper Paratus Award for Leadership to Admiral Paul F. Zunkoff, United States Coast Guard, in recognition of his personification of the Coast Guard's core values of honor, respect, and devotion to duty during his over 40 years of service. Admiral Zunkoff has exemplified the best of the Coast Guard character in crisis time and again, 
In 2010, Admiral Zunkoff served as the federal on-scene coordinator for the Deepwater Horizon spill of national significance, where he directed more than 47,000 responders, 6,500 vessels, and 120 aircraft during the largest oil spill in U.S. history. Once more, in 2017, he answered the call and helped a country in crisis during an unprecedented hurricane season. In the busiest month of U.S. hurricane activity on record, the Commandant oversaw one of the largest undertakings in Coast Guard history. Over 4,200 Coast Guard personnel, including active duty, reservists, civilian employees, and auxiliaries, answered the call. Despite damage to their own homes, facilities, and communities, Coasties put the country first and saved nearly 12,000 Americans, all under the leadership of Commandant Zunkoff. From his position as the most senior member of the Coast Guard, he ensured the most vulnerable were protected. His public position and personal outreach to members of the Coast Guard family despite the potential risk to his own career, provided comfort and shown exceptional leadership. In this, he has demonstrated true service and loyalty to the Coast Guard men and women who placed their livelihood and lives in his hands. He has overseen a historic error for the Coast Guard and successfully secured much needed and record-breaking funding for the Coast Guard thanks to his tireless outreach efforts. Under his leadership, the Coast Guard is on track to secure its first heavy icebreaker in over 40 years. His unblinking and frank assessment of the true impact of the 2017 hurricane season on the Coast Guard's operations and facilities led to a significant increase in financial support to rebuild the service. His tireless outreach to Congress has endured. The Coast Guard has the resources it needs to fulfill its mission and grow to be ready for the next generation's challenges. The Coast Guard, the Navy League, and the American people will be forever indebted to Admiral Zunkoff's leadership through surf and storm and howling gale. He has exemplified the best of the Coast Guard's leadership. His sense of honor, respect, and devotion to duty reflect great credit upon him and are in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard and the Navy League of the United States. Oh, hey, please, please, please be seated. No, please. There, there are several people I need to thank. Uh, first of all, the heads of the other sea services. I, I stand in the shadow of giants, and John Richardson, Bob Neller. Mark Busby, are, are you here with us tonight to represent MARAD as well? Uh, I didn't see you stand up earlier, but we can't forget our maritime administration. The Navy League, we have over 357 units scattered all over the country in some of the most remote parts of this great nation of ours. And it's the Navy League that represents every one of these units at a Sailor of the Quarter event. They come out and they find us. And what you've done is you've given me a retention problem. No one wants to leave the United States Coast Guard. Now, some people say, what am I going to do next after seeing that, that commercial, Bob, I'm going to go join the Marine Corps. <laughs> the best Marine Corps in the, United, in the world. Uh, but there's someone else I need to thank. And I'm going to re-gift this gift. Uh, because when we heard Lee Greenwood saying, the wing beneath my wings, Fran, that's you. So step up. I have an anniversary gift for you. The, no, the, really, the, the rest of the story, you heard we're building ships, we're building airplanes, we're modernizing the force. 
What you may not know is we're also building child development centers. We're bringing in a crew that are single moms, but we're not investing in that infrastructure. It was through Fran's effort with our appropriators we got funding in this year's budget. This is a readiness investment. It's an investment in our people, so Fran, this gift is for you. Step up, dear. I love you. Have a seat up here. <laughs> to present our second award of the evening, the Navy League Sea Cadet Alumni Award, I'd like to welcome our gala co-chair, Bruce Mosler to the podium. Good evening. Thank you very much, Alan. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, members of our military, it is truly a privilege to be with you tonight as co-chair of this great event, along with my great friend Tom Higgins, who time after time seems to get me involved with whatever he's involved with. Um, first thing I want to say is congratulations to all the honorees. Uh, we are honoring some extraordinary people, including a great friend, Frank Bisignano, who is one of the true American patriots. The Navy League has continued its proud history of supporting America's sea services under the incredible leadership of Alan Kaplan. So, Alan, on behalf of all of us this evening who are here, thank you for your extraordinary efforts. Now, as was mentioned, I have the privilege of presenting the Navy League Sea Cadet Alumni Award for extraordinary achievements of a former Sea Cadet who went on or goes on to an exceptional career in the sea services. This, this award is reserved for those that have demonstrated a dedication to ethical leadership, service to their country, and their local community, and each day lives up to the core values of honor, courage, and commitment. Captain Holly Harrison is a shining example of how the Sea Cadet Program introduces our nation's youth to a lifetime, a lifetime of exemplary service. As you will shortly hear, she is the first woman to command a Coast Guard vessel in a combat zone and also the first to receive the Bronze Star for her actions during Operation Iraqi Freedom. I now ask John Alger, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the U.S. Naval Sea Cadets to join me on stage to present this distinguished award to Captain Holly Harrison. Would you both please come forward? Is John coming or no? The Navy League of the United States is honored is to it? present the Navy League Sea Cadet Alumni Award to Captain Holly Harrison, United States Coast Guard, in recognition of her professional distinction, dedication to ethical leadership, and service to our country since graduating from the U.S. Naval Sea Cadet Corps program. As a young sea cadet, Captain Harrison served with passion and a true sense of patriotism. Captain Harrison joined the Sea Cadets at age 13. She was promoted to Chief Petty Officer in the Maryland Corsair Squadron. As a 15-year-old cadet, in the Central Maryland Division. She spent two weeks at Coast Guard Station Miami Beach, where she was involved in rescuing a family adrift at sea and intercepting a vessel smuggling cocaine. Her open and curious nature opened new career paths for her, and Captain Harrison committed to the Coast Guard by attending the Coast Guard Academy graduating in 1995. She has said that her sea cadet experience motivated her to keep through the challenges of the academy. She knew the rewards of a life in service to the Coast Guard. 
in her more than two decades of service since her graduation, Captain Harrison has shown honor and devotion to duty. She first served as a deck watch officer on U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Storis, followed by service on the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Kiska. Captain Harrison was a protocol officer for the Commandant of the Coast Guard in Washington, D.C., and commanding officer of United States Coast Guard Cutter Ottaquick. In March 2003, Captain Harrison led Ottaquick during the invasion of Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. She was the first woman to command a Coast Guard vessel in a combat zone and the first woman in Coast Guard service history to be awarded the Bronze Star Medal. While in Iraq, Captain Harrison's cutters performed maritime interdiction missions, search and rescue operations, escort and combat related operations while facing aggression from multiple fronts. Her bravery and leadership during this time reflects enormous strength of character. Her career continues to reflect her personal excellence that makes her fellow sea cadets proud to call her shipmate, including selection as one of 13 White House Fellows, Command of United States Coast Guard Cutter Northland, and the Coast Guard's first National Security Affairs Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. The Navy League will be forever proud of Captain Harrison's commitment to service. Her devotion to duty and sense of honor reflect great credit upon her and are in keeping with the highest traditions of the Navy League of the United States. I absolutely want to thank the Naval Sea Cadet Corps and the Navy League for this award. Uh, I didn't really know much about the military. Even though I grew up in a military family, all of my relatives were no longer serving when I grew up as a young child. So when I joined the Naval Sea Cadet Corps, this was really my first real experience with the military, and it was hands-on experience. And when I first joined, they sent me to boot camp, Navy Petty Officers and Chief Petty Officers, and they put me through boot camp, got to do damage control on the Buttercup Simulator, I uh, was on USS Shenandoah, USS Saginaw, got to go fly around on jets out at uh, Point Magoo. As a young high school kid, this was awesome. Everyone else was going to camp and staying at home with their parents and doing things in their hometowns, and I was literally deploying for my next assignment with the Navy or the Coast Guard. It could not get any better than that. And literally making drug busts with the Coast Guard or search and rescue cases, again, you couldn't write this stuff. So I was hooked at a very young age, so there was no way you were going to keep me out of the Coast Guard. I was going to fight and claw my way in. And I know uh, many other sea cadets I've kept in touch with feel the same way about what they've gone on to do with their careers. So on behalf of the many other sea cadets, thousands upon thousands of young boys and girls who were experienced in the military, uh, whether they went on to military careers or they just learned to respect the military, have a greater appreciation for service, and became a little bit better American citizens. On behalf of all those other sea cadets, thank you. And personally, I'd like to thank the Naval Sea Cadet Corps because I can literally trace the beginnings of my Coast Guard career to the day I joined the Naval Sea Cadet Corps back in the fall of 1986. So thank you. To present our third award of the evening, the Theodore Roosevelt Award, I'd like to welcome our gala co-chair, Tom Higgins, to the podium. Good evening. Everybody having a good time? Nah, everybody having a good time? All right, better. Uh, Supporters, friends, battle buddies, shipmates, Gunny, um, thank you for supporting us tonight. Uh, it's my honor tonight to present the Theodore Roosevelt Award. Assuming the presidency of the United States 
at a time of great technological innovation, social change, business expansion. Teddy Roosevelt challenged the nation's corporations and prominent business leaders to possess a blend of visionary business acumen, an abiding sense for reasonable and open competition, and a desire for focused corporate philanthropy. The Teddy Roosevelt Award of the Navy League of the United States is a reflection of these outstanding principles of corporate leadership. It honors corporations and American business leaders that epitomize the vision of leadership possessed by Teddy Roosevelt himself. Frank Bisignano is a true, true patriot. He epitomizes steadfast business leadership, the commitment of being an amazing corporate citizen, and I have had the honor of seeing his passion in the military community, his support to veterans, the sea services, and his strategic vision for success exemplified in his daily affairs. Frank is not just my boss, he's a friend, and there are only a few people in this room that understand the passion that flows through his veins in supporting our nation's military. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Frank up to the podium. The Navy League of the United States is honored to present the Theodore Roosevelt Award for Exceptional Leadership to Frank Bisniano. In recognition of his business leadership and, develop and commitment to public service at a time when our nation needs responsible corporate leaders in all American industries. Throughout his tenure career, he has worked to create career opportunities for men and women who served in uniform. As the chairman and chief executive of officer of First Data, he created the First Data Salutes program, providing broad opportunities and support for returning military and their families. The program provides best in-class resources and opportunities for veterans and military spouses through employment, education, and entrepreneurship. In less than four years of existence, First Data salutes his won numerous awards and accolades and thrives through the continued development of innovative programs and shared of best practices among other companies so that together the business community, community can holistically support our nation's all volunteer force and their families. Under Mr. Biziano's leadership, First Data made a $7 million commitment to the Institute of Veterans and Military Families at Syracuse University in 2015 in support of veteran entrepreneurship programs, of which the Coalition for Veteran-Owned Business and Center of Excellence for Veteran Entrepreneurship were formed. Additionally, while at J.P. Morgan Chase, he was a founder of the 100,000 Jobs Mission, a coalition of 170 firms that have hired 436,265 400, veterans. Throughout his career, he has been recognized for his work, including the Syracuse University's Chancellor's Medal for Outstanding Achievement for his innovation in technology and education, and the Colonel Michael Endres Leadership Award for Individual Excellence in Veteran Employment for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The New York Institute of Technology honored him with a Doctor of Commercial Science degree for his achievements in business and his philanthropic endeavors. Syracuse University bestowed him with an honorary doctorate of law degree for his distinguished business career and his work in championing higher education and supporting the disadvantaged. The Navy League and the Sea Services will be forever indebted to Mr. Biziano's leadership. His steadfast work to care for those that serve reflect great credit upon him and are keeping with the highest traditions 
of the Navy League of the United States. That uh, ovations for everybody here. Um, it's not lost on me that uh, I'm the first civilian to stand up here. And uh, whatever uh, the Teddy Roosevelt Award stands for, which is everything, is uh, for all my teammates and uh, all those I've worked with. I, um, I'm always reminded that Teddy Roosevelt was a uh, sickly boy in New York who uh, went on to run this country. And uh, as an assistant secretary of the Navy, uh, left his post in DC to go fight the battle. Uh, and there was a sickly boy who got on horses and led a brigade into war. And then posthumously received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, so when I think about, as a New Yorker, Teddy Roosevelt, I think about one of these great stories. And uh, I frequently think about what he said, which is how we like to live our life. Uh, do what you can uh, with what you have wherever you are. You know, do all the best you can. And uh, I've always blessed uh, in, in my life to be uh, sitting in a basement in Brooklyn uh, with 13 uncles and a dad and a grandfather who all argued about which was the best branch of the service because they all served. And uh, I saluted them every day of my life uh, for what they had done. Um, and as I stand here, the Navy League and Alan, what you've done is so outstanding. And uh, that, that home in Brooklyn that taught me that there is nothing better than civil service. As my dad had wore a government uniform for 45 years in some form, uh, is a chance here for me to say thank you to you. Thank you to all who have served to those who have protected our, our, our country. And when we hear these uh, team efforts, and they are team efforts, and my team's here, led by one of the great patriots of all time, Tom Higgins, a great American who has done so much for me and our country. And our team that created programs for spouses while, while their counterparts were out at war, uh, for me, that was the opportunity to serve uh, all those men in that basement in Brooklyn who had so proudly argued about what branch of the service was the best. So the great leaders in this room who are outstanding, those who have command troops, those who have protected our country, those who have uh, protected our liberty and freedom, um, I really think this award is about you. And uh, I, I am willing to accept it, but only for my team. And uh, I can only say God bless America and God bless our freedom. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, I have a, a little bit of a surprise tonight. I'm going to go a little bit off script. Um, it wasn't easy keeping this away from the headquarters staff. Um, but anyway, let's give a shout out to our Navy League headquarters staff who put this event together. Unbelievable. You know, I, I guess as national president, I can take the liberty to present one more award this evening. And I wanted to publicly honor someone tonight who embodies the heart and soul of our Navy League mission.
The Navy League National President, President Award is a first time award established to recognize a Navy League employee who has displayed unwavering traits of honor, courage, and commitment in his or her efforts to strengthen our mission. As an organization, we have a duty to make sure that our sea services have all the resources they need to thrive. To this end, our Navy League Legislative Affairs Department, consisting of only two headquarters staff, has answered that call. Together with a 36-person strong committee that spans the nation, they make this magic happen. Recently, the vast majority of our recommendations to Congress for the well-being of all four of our sea services came to fruition. Budget control caps were raised for fiscal years 2018 and 19 by almost 300 billion. A 355 ship Navy was codified in law in the fiscal year 2018 National Defense Authorization Act. 2.7 billion in an acquisition, construction and improvement budget was passed for the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard received nearly double its request for funding to help recover from the 2017 hurricane season. And there were many more. While all of our membership and many more here tonight played an important role in these key wins, it's the effort of one person that has shined over and over again. All who know her and work with her understand the phenomenal work that she does. She epitomizes what it means to be a team player. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege as national president to present Sada Fuentes, our staff vice president, external and government affairs, with the inaugural Navy League National President Award. Sada, please join me on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of our Navy League and our gala coaches, we sincerely appreciate all your support, not only for our organization, but most importantly for our sea services and their families. Thank you to all of the entertainment for tonight. It's been incredible, but it would really be fantastic to hear a few more songs. Please keep, enjoy, please keep on enjoying the evening. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, delivering closing remarks, please welcome to the stage Jim Bruns, National Executive Director of the Navy League of the United States. As every proud American, you heard it tonight with your songs, with your voice, with your expressions of support for the United States of America and all that we do. For the men and women in uniform, we thank them. For your support, we thank you. We hope that each of you will become members of the Navy League of the United States so that we continue to be one, one voice, mission focus. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for support. We look forward to your uh, sharing with us tomorrow the remainder of this exposition. Good night. <laughs>